going to uh, continue on in our study of uh, lost things. So we're in the Gospel of Luke, looking at lost things today. Uh, for today's study, we're going to look at the lost older brother. So this is probably sort of a, um, <clears throat> a different take on the uh, prodigal son last week. We looked at the, uh, the one that's called the prodigal, the younger son, the lost son. And I'm going to look at the lost older brother, because how many people know you can be lost and still be at church? Yeah. You can actually have a wrong attitude, or you can have things uh, in your life that are uh, keeping you from really uh, surrendering to God, and you're in the church. And it has a lot to do with attitudes, because I'm talking about some people who are very faithful to God. I'm talking about people that uh, you can count on, they're involved in ministry, but nonetheless they have an issue and we're going to see how that issue plays out today. I need uh, someone to get Luke chapter 15 verse 1 to 2. Fernando, you're going to get that nice and loud and we're going to do a quick review. So uh, we have a few people missing today, so I need you to uh, key up on the review, all right? Some of you were here last week. And so I need you to key up on some of these uh, pretty basic questions. Go ahead and read Luke 15, 1 to 2. All right, so uh, what did we say about this audience? What type of crowd do we have here of people in this uh, audience? Uh, Johnny? Yeah, there's a pretty good mix here of people. There's scribes and Pharisees. So Pharisees would have been people who were um, very proud that they kept the law and they would be considered uh, like uh, ultra-faithful fundamentalists. And, uh, and then there's the scribes. These are people that actually wrote out the Bible for a living. They were like the lawyers of this uh, culture. But the law, don't forget, of this culture was the Bible. So for them to be an expert in the law, they had to be an expert on the Bible and vice versa, or at least the law part of the Bible. There were sinners, tax collectors, and uh, other people that were called sinners in this day because they did not flow with the cultural norms of faithful Jews. And, uh, and these people are, uh, uh, there's always obvious people that we consider sinners, you know, people who are hedonists or alcoholics or something, we say, oh, that guy needs to get saved, or she just needs to get uh, saved. And, uh, and then there's people who are following Jesus. The disciples are here. And this is an important thought, because when we think of lost things, or people who are lost, usually people who are the most lost are usually quite confident that they're not lost. Hello. And so... Uh, and this is kind of a uh, twisted thing about human pride. The more lost you are, the less likely you think you are. And sometimes really faithful people, knowing that they're not quite, uh, uh, they're, that they're falling short of the kingdom of God in some area of their life, they'll say, man, I'm a lost Christian. But the reality, those are people that are usually doing quite well in the eyes of God. So what are the lost things that the parables speak about, uh, Will? Souls and people, yeah. So there's, there's five different uh, topics that we'll see, or different uh, parables. All of them referred to people. <clears throat> In Bible theology, now you're going to have to think back to last week. What does an inheritance represent? What does an inheritance represent, Will? All right, a blessing or a gift left to you, like by your father. Uh, what else could the inheritance represent? Uh, Arona? Something we might not earn or deserve. Something we don't earn or deserve. Anything else you, that we can add to that? Those are all right answers. So what else can we add to that? How about the inheritance represents the destiny of God for your life? So God has a future for you of blessings, and it's something that you, uh, you receive by, uh, by, uh, by faith. And your attitude toward these things is important. Uh, <clears throat> and so what does the word prodigal mean? And in what way are unsaved or backslid people prodigals in the eyes of God? Who remembers what prodigal means? It doesn't mean what some people think it means. Arona? 
Yeah, it means you're a reckless spender. You're a waster. It means you lavishly spend. And so uh, some of us, especially when we're young and we get ourselves our first paycheck, we do really dumb things with it. Anybody can relate to that. Uh, my wife has a funny story. I won't repeat it because I want to embarrass her about getting her first credit card as a, a, as a young military person and <clears throat> spending lavishly with it, not realizing that there was a bill to pay at the end of the month, <laughs> right? So put off the pain of paying those bills till later. But an inheritance, I mean a prodigal rather, is somebody that is wasting things. So in what way are unsaved or backslid people prodigals? Remember, it's not because they're lost. It's, uh, Rob? Yeah, God gives you talents, abilities, a calling, and you're wasting that. Uh, but even more so, what are you wasting? Uh, Johnny? Time. You're wasting time. That's a good answer, actually. What else? Anyone want to add to that? I right, remember the uh, Josh. Yeah, that's true. How about your life? Right, the old YOLO thing. Right, YODO. You only die once. That's what my my son turned YOLO into. He had kind of a cynical view of. He's like, no, it's not YOLO. You only live once. It's YODO. You only die once. So you better, better, better do right. <clears throat> so. Uh, Yodo, you only, have, uh, you only have one life to live for God. And so if you waste it, uh, you're prodigal because life is a blessing. If it's not a blessing to you, it's because sin has cursed it. Right? So for a lot of us, we have struggles. They're all related to our sin, other people's sin, the curse of sin in the world. Uh, God's desire is to bless us and to make our inheritance something that's going to prosper our life. Can you think of two brothers in the Old Testament who had different views of the inheritance? They had vastly different views of what was called the birthright. Uh, Teresa? Esau and, Jacob. Esau and Jacob. Exactly. So, uh, how did Esau feel about his birthright, his inheritance? Rob? Right, he was willing to trade it for a bowl of stew. I've had some good pasole and some good stew in my life, but I don't think I would trade the blessings of God for that. But we say that, but the truth is, when people are not living for God, it's usually for very petty reasons. It really comes down to it. Why won't you give your life to Jesus? Well, i got too much fun I have to have first. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was 26 and I, I found out about Jesus, I knew I was sick and tired of my fun. All that partying and uh, prodigal living I was enjoying was actually, uh, to me, I knew it was a shameful thing. I didn't want to continue on in that. Uh, And so Jacob's view is very different. Was Jacob a, a, a super righteous man? Was he a super good guy? Did he respect his parents and everybody around him? Did he deserve anything? But he valued it. And so it meant that when God began to deal with him, he had to make some hard choices. And at the critical moment in his life, when he had to make a certain decision, he made the right decision. And so God was able to give him the inheritance. Uh, Again, not because he earned it. That good decision simply put him in line for the birthright, for the inheritance blessing. And finally, uh, leading up to our story today, because we're going to look at the older brother, uh, what does the story of the lost or the prodigal son teach us about where God wants to meet us when we finally decide to repent and come home? Where does he want to meet us, Will? Yeah, he's willing to come to meet us. He meets him halfway, so to speak. So you move yourself toward God, God moves himself toward you. And so if you're running away from God, he's not far behind, but he's waiting for you to turn around. So he's always just one step behind you as you're running away. Uh, 
<clears throat> that's the way God works. That's a, a beautiful thought when you think about it. All right, let's look at the second half of the story. And this is the lost older brother. I need a lot of readers, please, so don't be shy if you want to read. Uh, I need someone to get Luke 15, 25 to 32. Uh, let's see, Arona. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. Need a reader. Raise your hand if you want to read. David. For, uh, Luke 15, verse 7 will be Tim, and verse uh, 10 will be Johnny. Ephesians 4, 31, uh, Yesenia, Galatians 6, 9, Sue, Matthew 6, 14 to 15, Rob, James 5, 9, Will. Make sure you take off your mask, Will, so we can hear you from the lobby when you read it. That's James 5, 9. Galatians 6, 1, Josh, Ephesians 4, 32, uh, Johnny, Romans 15, 1. Can you remember that, get that one for us, Trayvon? Or right, you got to read it nice and loud and take off your mask when you read it, okay? Uh, Isaiah 35, verse 3 to 4 is Arona. James 5, 19 to 20, Stephanie. Luke 15, 31 to 32, Josh. John 14, 1 to 2, uh, Fernando. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, Will. Psalm 51, 10 to 12, Rob, Philippians 4, 4. Don't be shy, people. I need readers. Sue, 1 Timothy 6, 6. Uh, Steve Anderlinden, Acts 15, verse 1. Yesenia, verse 5. Stephanie, and verse 7 to 10, uh, Aubrey. All right. So, uh, let's go ahead and let's look at the lost older brother. Look at the first line there, the prodigal son. And by the way, raise your hand if you have a comment or a question at any time. Okay, we want everyone to contribute. So I know I, I have a hard time shutting up, but, if, uh, but I will let you talk, by the way, if you, if you want to say something. So, all right, praise the Lord, nobody's laughing. So not enough coffee today, obviously. Uh, the prodigal son had a brother who never left the father's house. But the older son was still lost in his own way. So let's consider this. We're not talking about someone who's totally backslidden and going to hell, but we're talking about somebody who is still confused. You can be in the church and be confused. Luke 15, 25 to 32. Read that story for us. I love that line. You never gave me a kid, so me and my friend, he's talking about a goat to party with. I guess in the Middle East, that's like party time when you get a goat. So anyways, a goat to barbecue. So God bless America. I prefer cheeseburgers, and uh, if you're a sinner, you probably like a keg of beer. But anyways, we're not going there. <clears throat> but I just that's uh, that, in case you didn't know what he means by a kid, he's talking about a uh, goat that they would... Uh, Barbecue and, uh, and and have as a fellowship. Where's the oldest? Uh, where's the older son when the prodigal returns? Where is he physically located when his brother comes back? Stephanie, he's in the field working. The field working. And you got to think about what that represents. Uh, if the father's house is a type of the church, what might this represent, Rob? Okay, uh, Stephanie. That's a good uh, thought, Johnny. Do you want to add to that? 
That's it. Basically, you're doing the work of the kingdom. You're someone who's involved. You're someone who's doing the difficult labor of the kingdom. You're a faithful worker, whether it's an outreach or whatever it is, ministry that you have. I like to use outreach because it's the one that separates uh, uh, really serious Christians many times from people that want to be involved, but they want to do what they like to do because nobody likes to be out there on outreach in the sun, getting rejected, having people, you know, good outreach is great, but a bad outreach is really bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it kind of separates the serious from the less than serious. <clears throat> and so uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, go ahead and read that. All right, so this is all imagery that would be well known to New Testament readers. That the field represents the work of the business of the kingdom, which is always with people, right? So I know we do other work like uh, maintenance and stuff that doesn't involve people, but generally when we talk about the work in the kingdom, we're talking about working with people, and we are workers in that work. No verses 26 to 28. Why is the older son angry? Why is he angry? Johnny? Oh, he's angry because his brother ran off and sent his, his inheritance and was, didn't do his work and he had to double up his work and he had to go in the field and he was always faithful to his father and, and, and he, he, didn't, he didn't seem like he was getting any effort in his favor. So he was angry because of that. That's all part of the, uh, the answer, absolutely. Those are all the elements of the answer. Uh, Rob, you want to add to that? Yeah, he never got a party for everything he did. On top of that, he never got a party. He didn't get recognized. So I know there's a few ushers that are like, Pastor never gave me an award for being an usher. This sucks. Right? It's all work and no play. Well, that's because uh, the beatings continue until morale improves. That's, that's good training. Boy, you guys are so serious today. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to add to that? Did I see your hand up? You got the poll there. I'm sorry if I missed you. Um, so, uh, I was just going to say, it was, I feel like it was kind of just resentful and attitude towards his brother that he was so angry about. Those are all good answers. Everyone, everyone is, what you're saying is, you're nailing it. That's exactly right. All these things are true. And, uh, but... As I, in my previous comment, do you see how we're really talking about how we can be? Like a lot of us could sit there and say, yeah, that prodigal son was a knucklehead. I'll never do that. But how many of us have been the older son at church? Right? A lot of us could raise our hands. Some of you are holding down, but your hand's doing one of these. You know, your conscience wants to raise it. So I felt that way before getting chewed out in front of uh, my pastor's desk in Hawaii because I let the weed whacker burn out. So how come you didn't put oil in the weed whacker? Uh, forgot. <laughs> Burned the thing out. I was, that was my ministry. So you guys think being an usher is bad. I, the only, my pastor never let me be an usher. Pastor Taylor, he only let me be the weed whacker guy in the parking lot. So uh, this is how we can get uh, and how is this a contrast to the previous scriptures? When uh, What happened in the other two parables when the lost things were found? What was the attitude, uh, Josh? There was rejoicing. So the key thought is here, he's, he's all, all of the older uh, son's comments are about who? They're really about it. Go ahead, Stephanie. They're about himself. He's not thinking about, look, your brother, you know, the guy was living in the streets. He was a drug addict. He was eating pig's food. He's back. He's saved. He's cleaned up. What a miracle. He's not thinking about his brother at all. He's totally self-absorbed. How many people know that's a bad place, way to be if you're working in the fields of God? Right? It's like, really? It's all about you? Everything we do for, for God is about, really about you? 
Because that's his attitude. Luke 15, 7, and then 10. Read those nice and loud right through. So you got to be pretty selfish if God is rejoicing and the angels are rejoicing and you're like, this sucks. Right? <laughs> That's a pretty bad way to be. <clears throat> and so, no verse 29 to 30. Uh, I don't need to, we don't need to answer this question because Stephanie nailed it with the word resentment. What a perfect word how the older son feels uh, in the story. Ephesians 4, 31. All right. You're not supposed to have these attitudes in the church. You've got to put them away. In other words, how many people know that we sometimes feel this way and want to be this way, but he's saying put it away. That means that you, you can control your emotions. You can sit there and say, I know I ought to be mad and want to kill somebody, but I can't. That's why I always joke, every time the evangelists pray for me, they ask me, do you hate anyone? I'm like, yeah, I like to kill a lot of people. Because the truth is, uh, we have a lot of these feelings. The question is, are you going to let your feelings control your life or ruin your testimony? Or give you this attitude where you despise people who are getting saved or coming back to the Lord because you're not happy? That's a bad way to be. It's a bad way to be. Now, we already covered all these areas so well. The next question, what are some reasons? But let's look at what the Bible says about some of these reasons, because I think we already nailed all the reasons pretty well. Uh, Galatians 6, 9. Did I give that to anyone? So getting weary, we just get tired when we're working for the Lord, right? We can get tired of doing good. Not a healthy way to be. And so we're, not, we're supposed to catch ourselves when we're doing that. And we've got to figure out, how do I get over this tiredness? Well, that's why we need to be prayed up when we're involved in the things of God. Because if we don't have the strength to do all that needs to be done in our own strength... And we also need to be careful because when we're tired, especially you men, tired and hungry, how can we be? Uh, grouchy. Right? And the worst day of work ever. You said that yesterday and the day before. I'm just tired. Just leave me alone. You said that yesterday and the day before. Get over it. It's just total uh, human nature that we can be this way. But we need to be aware of it as a Christian that it doesn't catch up to us and cause us to lose hearts or to have a bad attitude toward other people. Matthew 6, 14 to 15. How many people know sometimes when people come back, we got to forgive them. They left the church under a bad cloud. They caused problems, or maybe there was some animosity there. And so Christians that have a hard time forgiving, it's usually because, like the oldest son, they have an entitlement attitude toward their brethren. Well, I do so much more than her anyways. Well, you don't have a right to feel that way. Right? You don't have a right to, to use that as an excuse to not forgive. Uh... James 5, 9. So don't grumble. Because we're going to be judged by our heart attitude. So we can relate all these scriptures to the, oldest, uh, to the older son. So what is the correct attitude? Let's read this question carefully, okay? Because I worded it a certain way. What is the correct attitude of the faithful toward one who returns from a time of failure, error, or backsliding? What is the correct attitude? Uh, Will? Okay, that's true. 
And that's easy to get from our story, but there's more than that. That's our, that has to be part of our, it's actually maybe better to say our responsibility toward them. Stephanie, did you want to add something? Thankfulness? No, that's part of it. But let's talk about someone who's come in. We have responsibility toward them. Uh, Diane? Redemptive is a key thing. Uh, anyone want to add to that? Welcome, okay. Uh, by the way, the word welcome is sometimes sketchy because sometimes you, re- you can't help but remember like the problems they caused before. Like, are you here for round two or three? Because if so, I'm not going to rejoice yet. Right? But that's, sometimes we have to be careful because people are very crazy. Uh, Josh, anyone else? Was gonna, I saw a couple of hands. Jim? Yeah, let's just put it this way. What you're all missing is that there's more to that than just being happy they're back or thankful. There's more to it than that. You have responsibility to help bring them along. Do you have something to add, Karina? Yeah, but one, one thing I would add, though, because you're right is that there's a scripture that says if your brother sins against you seven times and comes and says, I repent, you need to forgive them, right? How many people know, some people come back, but they haven't repented yet. That those are exactly, exactly, that's the direction we're going. Jim and Teresa are kind of aiming us in the right direction. Let's look at all these scriptures and you'll see it. Galatians 6 1 will sound familiar because Jim just read it. Who's got it? Go ahead, Josh. So the point is, we're trying to restore them or we're being gentle about it. We got a lot of uh, military people in this church, and, and, and the ones who aren't military are, are mostly like former athletes or gang members. And so the attitude is, uh, <clears throat> you know, we'll restore them, but it's going to be the hard way. <laughs> We're glad you're back. Drop and give me 50, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that's not really what the Bible teaches. Hello. Uh, let's go on. Ephesians 4.32. All right, that word kind uh, takes practice, guys, right? And some of you ladies know how to act kind, but I think you need to be kind, too. (laughs) 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 Romans 15, 1. Amen. Romans 15, 1. Go ahead, nice and loud. Amen. Bear with the scruples of the weak, right? The strong help the weak. That's the motto of our church. Right? We don't act like it sometimes. <laughs> sometimes we act like social Darwinism, you know? The, the strong survive. <laughs> Survival of the strongest. It's not way, the way the church is supposed to be, saints. Isaiah 35, 3 to 4. So this is a thought that goes all the way back to the Old Testament that the Pharisees and scribes often missed. And in one sense, keynote, 
Remember who this story is being told to. There's a lot of scribes and Pharisees in this audience. Take note, because we're going to talk about this before we finish up today. All right, what about uh, toward those who are backslidden and have not fully repented? James 5, 19 to 20. So there's a reward there, there's a challenge there, there's a command there, implied, that we ought to try to turn people who have fallen away. We ought to try to. It's a good task to want to do. Doesn't mean that you're going to succeed every time, uh, but you say, well, so-and-so hasn't repented yet. Don't wait for them to repent, go challenge them. Maybe they'll repent if you, if you challenge them. I like to challenge people to about the decisions they make. They don't always like that, but that's the best way to make people think. Uh, amen. And so that's important what she said. The Holy Spirit will complete the work. Because there are some people that believe in Christian magic. They think, oh, I'll just pray and the Holy Spirit will get to them. Uh, why don't you call them too? And talk to them. Pray, call them, or visit them, and then let the Holy Spirit get to them. And I know our fears that we'll say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. But I'm here to tell you, doing nothing is always the wrong thing. And number two, uh, I don't think God is going to send you to hell for trying to pull someone out of hell. It's not like God's going to say, you just sucked that follow-up. So... <clears throat> It's not, it's not like that. And the reality is they're still responsible for their decision. All these people you meet in the street, they always say, well, I'd be a Christian, but I met some Christians who were blah, blah, blah. Well, I didn't like Christians growing up. I didn't become one until I was 26. But I didn't get saved because the people in the church were nice to me. I got saved because I heard some preaching that I needed to hear about salvation. And I decided, because I didn't even get saved in this fellowship, I decided living for Jesus was more important than letting my feelings get bent because somebody didn't shake my hand at church. Should have got an amen there, but... <clears throat> but that's how a lot of people are who leave, right? They're looking for an excuse to leave. Why would you leave the gospel? I don't care if every Christian is a hypocrite. I'm still going to cling to Christ. If that means I have to go to a church full of hypocrites, praise the Lord, I'll fit right in. <laughs> and you ought to understand that too before you jump to, well, they're just so this and that. Well, thank God for Christians that do call us out once in a while. Because be, I've been called out a few times. I thank God for it. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Uh so, where are we at? Did we do uh, Luke 15, 31 and 32? Go ahead and read that. So, does the Father's love diminish toward uh, one just because it's being extended toward another? No, but that's how we feel sometimes. It's like God's love, you know, oh, she's getting more share of God's love than me. God's love is infinite. There's no such thing as, it doesn't run out. It's like God loves everyone in the church, but he ran out when you got saved. So it sucks for you. God, God hates you, but welcome to the potter's house. It doesn't work that way. But we feel that way sometimes. Because we're not getting the attention. I tell my friends who are pastors, especially young men who are pastors, if you are in this to be appreciated, you made a bad career choice. Yeah. We're in this because people need help and God has risen you up and called you to help them. If you need a pat on the back to do that, you're going to have a hard time being a pastor because most people don't pat you on the back and the ones that do usually end up because there's a knife in their head. <laughs> and you just got to be Teflon on the 
both ends, the front end and the back end, and just take it. So, uh, because that's what we're called to do. Jesus died for sinners. I can at least live for them. Uh, John 14, 1 to 2, and Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Amen. So, although the older son was faithful and he was still in the father's house, what was lacking in his life? What would you say it is? There's like one fundamental thing that's clearly lacking in his life. Uh, Arona? Joy. Joy. And joy is something you've got to stir up in you. Though It's a gift of the Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have joy in you. Karina? Right, and gratefulness really is joy, though. It's joy for a reason, and the reason is Jesus died for us. All right, but we think the reason needs to be more earthly, like, you know, uh, if he really loved me, I'd make more money. I mean, we can get really stupid when we're frustrated. We can jump to some really bad conclusions when things are, are, when we're going through a difficult time, and we all go through those. So we need to be careful. we got to figure this out. It took me years to figure out how to stir up my own joy so I could have joy even when things were not going well, so I could turn on the joy switch. Because you got to turn it on. You can't wait for your feelings to turn it on for you or circumstances. It's in you by the Holy Spirit. You have to turn on your joy. Let's read through these scriptures together and see if we can catch this. But you're going to see gratitude, like our sister mentioned, is going to be brought in one of these, uh, forth in one of these texts. Psalm 51, 10 to 12. All right, so the psalmist recognizes that in his backsliding, he's lost the joy of his salvation. In this case, he's actually repenting and saying, I need to get my heart right. Create me a clean heart, Lord. But nonetheless, we as believers know that the joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4.4. 4. And so that you know that was going to show up in this, uh, this study, right? Rejoice in the Lord when... Rejoice is expressing joy. That's what the word rejoice means. Always. And again, I say rejoice. Wow. Over and over again? Yes. Learn to do it. Speak it. You won't feel it sometimes, but you better speak it. If you speak it enough, you'll feel it. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Godliness with contentment. That's that gratitude our sister mentioned. If you're saved and you can accept that God is providing for you and God is meeting your need, you won't really have this desire for stuff all the time. For more of something or this to make your life happy. Contentment is a choice. All right, God, you got me in this situation. You got me in this place. It'd be nice to make more money. It'd be nice to be able to do this or that. But I can be content. This is what I have for the rest of my days. I'll learn to be content with it. If you can embrace that attitude, you will have joy. You will have joy. And, it's, and again, it's a choice you have to make. Some see in this story the contrast. Listen to what I mentioned, what I said earlier about Pharisees. Some see in the story the contrast between the Gentile converts who were coming into the church, and the Jewish converts who believed in the Father already and then accepted Christ as their Savior, what did some Jewish believers try to force on the Gentile converts that would have robbed them of their joy? 
What were some of the Jewish believers hung up on, Gage? Keeping the law. The Judaizers. These are the ones that said you must be circumcised. That would reduce the number of converts from Camp Pendleton sizably if we said you need to get circumcised to come to our church. Right? <laughs> there would be a lack of joy <laughs> in getting saved. Teresa? Teresa? He's living with the father, yet he still doesn't have that sense of how much his father loves him. Very good. And how many people know that's true for 99% of all the teenagers in the United States? Right? Like, you may have had a bad father, but I didn't. I had a good father, and I still was like, I can't wait to leave here when I was 14. Right? I could not wait to leave, so when I was 18, I left as soon as I could. <clears throat> Amen. But... As I got older, I began to realize how much my father loved me, and I missed it. I didn't catch it as a young man. As I grew older, though, I began to appreciate what he did for me. So this is a very common problem in uh, American culture. All right, let's look at this final group of scripture. Be ready to answer the last question. The older son is a type of what? Uh, we, there's a lot of words I could fill in there, but let's just read about the Judaizers and what Peter says to them that's very interesting about that flows with this story, uh, this topic, rather, of, uh, of struggling uh, faithful saints. Acts 15, 1, 5, and then 7 to 10. So think of the older uh, br brother as a type of the Jewish people. They've known God. They've had the uh, word of God. They've had the law. They've been faithful to it. And along come these Greeks, right? These Irish, these Mexicans, these black people, right? These Samoans. Along they, here they come, and they're not even keeping the law. They're praising Jesus, acting all happy. <laughs> and so this is a, uh, a picture that many people believe is, has that other meaning to it in the story. As Christians, we can relate to it because we can become resentful in the church. And that's really what the older son is. He's a type of a uh, joyless, resentful believer. And we can all get that way. But it's also a picture of the relationship between the Jewish folks and, uh, the, and the church. That sometimes that lack of joy is present when you meet an Orthodox Jew, if you've ever met some. They're so hung up on the law, they have no joy. Muslims have happier looks on their face than, uh, th than these Orthodox Jews. I will tell you, in Israel, they, the Orthodox Jews persecute the, the Jesus-believing Jews, the Messianic Jews, very much for this very reason. So it's an interesting thought. Okay, we're right at the end. We have about three minutes. Uh, listen to me. Uh, I'm going to be putting some more information out because I'm expecting a few more people to come in the door in the next ten minutes. We're going to start in about eight minutes. Uh, and uh, we're not starting to live stream till after the offering today because i got a few special announcements about the new rules and what we're doing, Okay. Uh, remember, don't congregate at the door there. Keep moving. 
There is going to be a children's church today. Uh, another in the video series that Pastor Rob has so the kids can go. Make sure they use the restroom and that they've cleaned their hands with some sanitizer before they go in there. And uh, we'll start service in eight minutes. I'll need everyone on the platform who's supposed to be here in eight minutes, okay? So appreciate your faithfulness. Uh, if I could have uh, Brother uh, Fernando, why don't you close up the Bible study in a word of prayer?